picking up right, like I said, right where we left off. We're going to try to hurry up and get to chapter 3. Right now it's primarily protein purification, which, a little factoid, vitamin D is the number one biochemistry unless they change it. Biochemistry lab itself is always a biochemistry too now as a historical side note. Topically, it has little to nothing to do with biochemistry too. It actually has to do with biochemistry one. The only reason was biochemistry to be a one semester class and had a biochemistry lab. And so we saw it in the screen. When we split the parts into two different sections and we had a lab that came with it, at that time, for especially for the pre-med majors, they had all these labs that were only offered in the fall and then one or two in the spring. And so they said, hey, why don't we just move the biochemistry lab to the spring? I say, okay, it's time for me. Because it's time to stand alone anyway. But I say all that because a lot of the techniques in the, in the, in the compounds that you work with, that, that you work with in the biochemistry lab, actually has to do with the chemistry that we're talking about now. Okay, and so and, and it's not going to be about you trying to discover you know, a metabolic pathway or something like that for biochemistry too, or medicinal drug type trials. So try to keep all the stuff that you cover the semester and fresh your mind so that way we never need to work on it in my chemistry lab next semester. It'll be easier. Okay, and I, like I said, I have, they haven't come up with the schedule yet to know who's teaching or what time biochemistry lab is next semester. I'm hoping, knock on wood, that for whoever's sake it is and for your sake as well, that meets two days a week. Because a couple years ago we had changed it back when I was teaching it, where we'd meet for two, I think it was like two, two and a half hours, like twice a week, rather than trying to do everything once a week for like five hours. And so, um, hopefully they keep it that way. All right. So, that being said, today is really is primar primarily about protein purification, characterization, things that you can do within the lab, okay? So, to review, some of the stuff like I said, to review, is you can imagine if you have a cell, or if you do have a cell, and within that single cell there are gazillions, scientifically that's the term, I'm sure, gazillion different types of proteins. And not only that, but sometimes these proteins have multiple polypeptides and things that all come together to form complexes. And maybe you want the entire complex, maybe you don't. Okay. What happens, like how do we separate and identify a single protein out of this milieu of all the different proteins and the nucleic acids and the sugars and the lipids and all that kind of stuff. So we have to know physically how to get it out in one of some different ways. We're going to do the protein biochemistry in this chapter. If we have time this semester, chapter 9 is where we work nucleic acid biochemistry, which is where we do cloning and things like that. Okay, so in order to study the protein, you have to, and to try to characterize it, you have to have a homogeneous sample. Otherwise, you don't know like what you're seeing is due to artifact or not. Okay, so there's to make homogeneous sample, they do what they call isolation. Okay. And the term is called homogenization. Okay. Homogenization just literally means to break open that cell to get everything out of it. So it's humble means the same, to make it the same mixture. In fact, one one machine that's so awesome, if you ever get a chance to work with it, you, you ought to, it's called the homogenizer. <laughs> and it breaks open cells. And I'll, I'll actually, I'll probably explain how it works in a moment. I don't think I actually had a picture of it. Because back whenever I was doing my first postdoc, they were really new. They were just really coming out in full force around that time. Some of the other methods are called sonication, but that's just another way to homogenize. And we'll talk about sonication. Resolve cycles, and once in a while you have to have detergents. Hopefully you can remember to tell you the reason why. Okay, so what are some of the ways? Oh, these are actually some pictures they did not come across very well. The old days, you can actually use a mortar, and, and sometimes you still can use a mortar and pestle to literally crush the sheer, the sheer, the sheer force of um, the cells open. By the way, it also matters on what species, what kind of cells that you're using. Which is stronger, yeast cell or typically yeast cell or bacterial cell? Yeast. Okay, yeast. You know, a lot of times it, it can be really hard. It depends on the bacteria as well, but just in general. Okay. The second picture I have here, that's an old wearing blender. Like you can literally blend. If it's if you're doing tissue homogenization, like something from like the liver, you literally cut it up, you stick it in a blender, and you blend it. Okay. 
The one next to it is a sonic heater. Now, I purchased a sonic heater. We actually used it. Some of you may even be able to have a chance to use it. Uh, if you can research with me. We use, what does a sonic heater do? How does it break open cells? Sound waves, okay? And so that probe, and these different size probes, vibrates at such a high frequency it causes the sound, the sound waves and will cause the cells to break. The problem with almost all of these, and we touched this one, is that when the cells break due to entropy, it gives off a lot of heat, which what would be bad about, you know, we haven't discussed it yet, what's bad about giving off a lot of heat whenever you're trying to purify proteins? You can see nature, it can start to fall apart. And so a lot of times, if we did this in the sonic heater, if we did sonic heater, we actually have a cabinet we put it in. Let me move this up. We would actually do it this way. We would have a beaker with our material, blah, 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 blah. And that is setting in ice, in an ice chamber to help keep it cool. And you only do it for short pulses and things like that. <clears throat> now the homogenizer, which is not on here, because it show you a picture of homogenizer, it would be boring, it looks like a box. Okay. But I'll talk about some of the other methods that use shear force. The other way to do it is called a French press. That is not a homogenizer, but I've had good luck with a French press in the past. Some people like it, some people hate it. What do you suppose a French press does? Has anyone used a French press not in science? Yet yeah. for coffee, it's the same principle. Essentially, except the, at least the ones I've worked with, what it is is you've got this, it kind of looks like a piston, you know, it's got this tube or a, a metal cylinder, and it's got a little tiny hole, I mean, really, really small hole there. You put your solution in it, and then it literally has like a piston looking thing that pushes down on it, it's like a, like a French press coffee. And what happens is it's forcing all of the cells to go through a tiny hole, and so they literally squish each other. Kind of reminds me of an analogy in real life is like, you never run in a chicken house. Does anyone ever run in a chicken house? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, at least once in your life. So where I grew up, it's like the chicken capital of the world, like a multi capital of the world, right? And so then he has these huge, Long, you may have seen them on TV, whatever barns, like long houses that are hold, that hold like chickens, and turkeys, and it's not uncommon to have like a hundred thousand, you know, in that. But and so it stinks, it's hot, and big fans and little things of water that comes down, all that kind of stuff. Form. But you don't scare them because if you run through it, they will trample each other trying to get out. Right? They'll push through. You know, it's worse than the Metro Link at you know at five o'clock. So, but. Uh, yeah, it's like that. So you're, they're forcing the bacteria or yeast being forced through a tiny hole to cause so much of it that the shear pressure comes in to, to explode. Um, <clears throat> and that way, sometimes you have to do multiple passes in order to get it completely open, all of it open and everything. And it still gives off a lot of heat. Sometimes, some people complain because a little hole get clogged. But, I mean, I never had that problem. And I'm sure there are other methods. There's another one that's really cool called a bead beater. Not to be confused. No, no I won't say it. Uh, <laughs> this is really easy when you visualize. What's a hypothesis here on a bead beater? What's going to be happening? You're going to beat up the, the yeast or the, the bacteria. And what it is, they take your solution. So you've got, you know, don't hate my drawing. And I'll put it in like a tube. So there's your solution. It's got your bacteria or yeast in it. And then they'll toss in a bunch of glass or some type of really hard polymer beads. Make it pretty thick. And they put it on something that kind of reminds me of the paint shaker, the loaves. And it shakes back and forth, and the bees literally beat the snot. Well, not the snot, the cytosol out of the. <laughs> now you're making them sound really dirty. It's like, you know, not an obvious way you call cytosol. It's also made from cytosol out of them. But yeah, it does. It's, it smacks the cytosol right out of it. Because so, it shakes it back and forth. And it's really loud. If you're using glass water, you can imagine it can get kind of loud. <clears throat> I think that I've worked. And some of the people in my own lives use that. I, I know. Um, 
another way, like I said, one that I really liked, my, my preferred one is called a homogenizer. They, it may be cheaper now, but a simple homogenizer unit used to be tens of thousands of dollars at least. Okay. But they were very efficient. Luckily, my lab had money, so we could buy one. It looks, it's very plain looking. It looks like a big box. I mean, we're talking a decent size box on the lab bench. It's got a pump that goes in, so that's the intake, and it's got a pump that comes out. And so this is on ice, once again, usually, because it's going to get hot. And that's a beaker. This will have your sample in it. That you're wanting to do it, what, that you're wanting to break open. I don't know if you've worked with any bacterial or yeast or even an onion um, thing. Typically, we're talking about we we resuspend the color into a buffer solution. Okay, so it looks like a cloudy, self turbid, a turbid solution. Turbid or turbidity is just a scientific term for cloudiness. Okay, so what it is is on the inside of this box. It's kind of like the labyrinth. Like what it is, is I mean, it's like a little maze. Of course, you can't see it. And so we're talking meters and meters worth of this really skinny tube. And that's why this comes out. And all the pump does is it sucks it in so fast. That's like the running of the bowls of Pamplona. Pamplona. And so it sucks the, the bacteria or the yeast in so fast that they smack into the walls. So they go smack, 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 all the way through until you literally, once again, beat the side of the salad. And then it comes out. And so usually you have to do one or two passes, whereas the French press, maybe you have to do multiple passes. Um, the sonic heater, you just have to do multiple. Some, that and the problem with sonic heaters, you can only use, use really small amounts. Because also the thing where sometimes these monitors can take you know, liters. It depends. Yeah? Is that Oh, that's your solution. I just want to show the different solution okay. and what's coming up. So it would have your sample. But yeah, it is, like I said, if you just look it up online, this is going to look like a box. But it's what's inside that box where they just have meters worth of little maze. It's like almost like a little corn maze or something that is like sucking through. And I thought that was top, top um, for this time of year. But then it pumps it out. You still, once you broke open the cells, though, you still got a bunch of. It's a crap or snot, but the, uh, the technical term. You got a bunch of junk in along with it, okay? So you're gonna have your protein, you got your proteins, your nucleic acids, you got your lipids, you got your sugars, you got lots of different things, okay? Now, even within the proteins, you got lots of different proteins within the ones from the, that you're wanting to get. So we have to have some way to separate that out. So once you've got the broke open stuff that looks, and actually does kind of look like snot, has anyone worked with? protein purification before, it gets very viscous because you've broken open the cell. And so it's got proteins in it, it's got lipids coming out, because lipids don't like a lot of the obvious stuff, it's got sugars, and so it gets snotty. Okay. <clears throat> That's not a scientific term. Scientific term is viscous, but snotty is so much more colorful and southern. Okay. So we've got to separate it out. And the easiest way to do that is through centrifugation. <clears throat> I would never ask you to memorize the different RPMs, revolutions per minute, <clears throat> like what's going to come out of different parts. But you just take that big mixture of junk and you stick it in a centrifuge. And what this figure is, I think this one, I don't remember if this came out of your book or the old book, but it doesn't really matter. What they're showing here, oh, actually, this is a mortar and pestle. It just looks different than the kind that you're used to from the apothecary kind. Um, pharmacist kind. Um, that's the same principle. But what they've done is they've broken it open. You could use a homogenizer, you could use your stomach here, you could use some way to break it open. Then they centrifuge it. Okay, the centrifuge I love to use is not like that, but they centrifuge it. And what happens is that a relatively low, this is 600 Gs, I think, like I said. I wouldn't 
ask you to memorize these numbers, but a relatively low um, speed, you're going to get a supernatant, that's the liquid portion, and you're going to get a solid out. And that solid right there is going to have nuclei, the nuclei are more dense, and anything that's unbroken, that's really dense. So not everything may be 100% broken. Okay. Then as you spin the supernatant more, and now we're talking, you know, 100,000 degrees or whatever, you're going to get out the small subcellular components, like the mitochondria, if they haven't broken open, things like that. And then finally, I mean, we would spin it, depends upon what you're trying to isolate, it's not a common that's going to even be beyond 100,000 Gs for a while. And you're ultimately going to get the protein, okay, the part of the but you still have to get, and that's, that, that's, this is assuming that your protein is soluble, okay? So it is possible for you to have an insoluble protein. What's one reason, what's the main reason, or a main reason that you're gonna have an insoluble protein? It's not gonna be more liquid, it's gonna be in the solid here. <coughs> Try to think about it. What is this liquid made up of? Like water, it's aqueous phase. So what kind of protein will not be in it? What kind of protein will not like water? Where would they be located at? And is everything in the cell aqueous based? No. What parts of the cell are not going to are going to be lipophilic, not hydrophilic? Cell membranes. Okay, membranes in particular. Right. So if you have a membrane protein, you're going to want to add detergent in. And the reason why the detergent is so it's going to help wash them out. And that's assuming that it's still um, uh, what we call will be nature. Okay, but if it's a soluble protein, they'll be in the liquid layer. Right. But we have to be able to visualize or get an idea of where our protein is. So what you want to do is each step of the way, you're going to want to take samples and to look at them. The easiest method, what's the easiest method for looking for proteins? What's the quickest? Do we know? You want to take advantage of one of their physical properties that all proteins would have. Sometimes I hear people say, oh, you'd run out on a gel. That, that takes a long time. Plus, then you're assuming that you're going to have a Western blot. So that takes even longer. The quickest way, usually, is spectrophotometry, spectroscopically. <clears throat> what are we using here? What instrument use, uses do you use for spectrophotometry? This is one of those, um, Jeopardy has the dumb answer category. What would be the dumb answer for a spectrophotometry? Spectrophotometer. It's a spectrophotometer, yes. And typically for proteins, we want a UV vis. So it's a you can have an IR. That's what an IR spectroscopy is. They're costing spectrophotometry. Um, but that would be useful here. Usually we're looking at, we want the UV vis. There's a couple reasons why. One, they have written down here. Is the, it's called the Bradford dye. It's a Kumasi blue. It's ink. It's just ink with the blue ink that was Kumasi blue ink pens. It binds to proteins. So you can use it to visualize and to get an idea off of a standard line to get an idea. But another reason why is proteins, the, the amino acids tyrosine and tryptophan, both are visible in the UV spectrum. Okay. They both absorb light at 280 nanometers. <coughs> there are also other ones. There's a one called the Bayeret method. There's Lowry's method, things like that. But the one that, uh, just in general, is either Bradford or, or just using, using straight UV bits and looking for tyrosines and tryptophans. Because the parts that have more protein in it will have a higher absorption based off of the standard. <coughs> Oh, right. 
then we know what samples may have protein in it, but it may not be our protein. We want to separate all the proteins out from each other, ideally, right? So where we have a homogeneous sample. This is where, where I want to spend the bulk of the time, if at all possible. This is where we're going to use column chromatography. We're going to use different chromatographic methods. This is so important. We did this whenever I taught, of course, I didn't have most of you organic chemistry. I think though, if I did have you, um, we would have done column chromatography. I used to run at least one or two columns. <clears throat> I used to also do it for many once in a while. Okay. But what's true with all chromatography is you always have a mobile phase and a stationary phase. And for column chromatography, the mobile phase moves, of course, it's quite mobile. The stationary phase is the material that's inside the column, the resin. Confusing. They call what comes out, it's called the eluent. But I probably won't ever, well, I may say that once in a while. Okay. Like I said, all of this is. I'll explain the little picture first that they have, and then I'm going to draw it differently, I'm sure, over and over and over again. Okay, like if we were able to do it for organic chemistry, we usually res result, result, resol resolution or resolving something and separating it out. We would usually do the resolution of two dyes, like a fluorescein dye and two mossy blue or some other type of blue dye. And when they're together, they're green. Of course, if they separate out, you can see the yellow and the blue come out differently. <clears throat> But the whole idea here is you have a sample that's a mixture of things. You've got this column that's packed with some type of resin that's going to utilize either a chemical or physical property. And things will separate based off of how well they like or dislike the column's resin, like the stationary phase. And so here they've got the sample. They put it in. And with time, things that really like the column will stay longer if it's an affinity column. So there, there are a couple of different types. One's called an affinity column, which makes you know makes sense if it has an affinity. And one's called size exclusion, which is based only off of size. So it's based only off of a physical property. <clears throat> so here, this one really likes it. This one right here really doesn't. So it's going to come off. The, way, the reason why I think that this is kind of... I don't like the way they have this set up because it looks a little confusing. But this one will come off first, and a little while later, this one will come off, and a little while later, that one will come off. You still need to take the UV vis of each of these samples to know exactly where the peaks are. And so then your UV vis spec whoops, spectrum would look something like this. Whoops, that's supposed to be a straight line. Um, this is absorbance. And this is, you can either do it based off of time or sample, it doesn't really matter sample of time. And so what we would see is this is absorbance at 280 nanometers. Nothing, 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 nothing. Then what is that red? It would probably have a little bit. And then next color. And then the dark color. You know. So that's ideally. Because then you could say, oh, look, we can now separate out, the, pull these samples together, pull those samples together, or pull those samples together. Run them on gels. Do This is where you'd want to do your Western blotting and things like that. So that's just generic, let's call, let's call chromatography generically. So that being said, what are some of the things that we can do? Which, which one did I do? Oh, I did gel filtration first. And then, well, I don't like that. I wish I would have flopped them around, but I won't, I'll go in order. One type is called size exclusion. What do you suppose is going to be separating things off of? It's size. It's also called gel filtration because the beads, the resin, typically they're gel based. They don't have to be, I guess, but typically they have some type of gel base. This is what it looks like. I've got another picture coming up that'll probably be better than mine, but this is our column. The whole idea is you've got these beads or this resin. 
Okay, it goes on and on. And these kind of look like Swiss cheese or bowling balls with their holes all the way through. See, there are little, little tiny holes in the beads. So the idea is as you pour your mixture in, what do you think is going to come off first? Something really big or something really tiny? It's the opposite. It's something really big. That's why it's called size exclusion. The reason being, based off of the holes, the size of the holes, size of the hole, that's hard for me to say. I feel like my tongue's going to fall off. The size of the holes of the beads. Um, things that are really tiny, they can actually fit inside. So they'll come in and out, in and out. They take a long time because they're traveling through the bees, blah, 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 blah. Versus something that's really large, it can't fit. Whoops, I can't fit, so I'm going to go around the big beads instead. Does that make sense? So they have a limit based off of what they can do. So you may want to run this one first. Some people like to run these first to get rid of, if you have a big idea of what size your protein is, Maybe your protein's really tiny, so you can get rid of almost everything bigger. Maybe your protein's really big, so you can get rid of small, small. But um, this is just one method. And that's what's called size exclusion. So the order of evolution is biggest comes off first. Technically, shape can cause an issue, you can imagine if it's rod-like, where it's like an eel or a snake and it's a flexible protein, maybe it can go in a little easier than something that's spherical or ovoid, um, elliptical. But I don't know if I'm on the starting to venture on the order of bi biophysical biochemistry. <clears throat> okay, and so that's what this slide is showing. Size exclusion. I, I can't see the color of the part, except for the red. But hopefully you can. You can see fourth material, whatever is small, actually kind of can travel through and gets stuck. It takes longer versus something that doesn't fit, so it just goes around. Yeah. So it's based off of size. Another one, oh, this is just showing you the saying. It's from the old book. But you can see how some of it gets stuck inside and some of it go around the sides. But I don't like that picture as well, but some people do. This is the elution profile. So there, that's what it would look like as it comes off. If you're doing, um, like, like I said, usually we're looking at absorbents. All right, so the other broad class classes are the affinity ones. Okay. So affinity chromatography. There are lots of types of affinity chromatography. What do you suppose it's going to separate things based off of? Affinity. It depends on what the beads are. The beads, so one of the easiest ways to think of it is remember proteins Oftentimes we'll have a charge. Well, they have to. They have a PI. Just, since they're made up of amino acids, some of those amino acids are charged, some of them not. It depends on pH, all that kind of stuff. So there's overall a charge to a protein. So one of the easiest types of affinity chromatography to visualize is, is charge. So you can imagine, and they make these columns. Like I said, don't judge me because I'm such an amazing artist. So here's the bead. The bead's got a little linker that hangs off of it and an ion. <clears throat> For example, it hangs off of that. So maybe it's a phosphate. That's just one example. So I'm just going to really draw out the phosphate. It's negatively charged. Phosphate is. Obviously, you can't just have phosphates by themselves. So when you pour the column, the phosphate's going to have something like sodium or magnesium, you know, something, a positive charge to balance it off. But, you know, this is all over the place. There are these, these beads make up the entire column. I'm only showing it like this, just because it, well, that's supposed to be straight line, just because it's going to be easier to draw. So as you add in your, your sample, what proteins are going to want like that column? Positively charged proteins. And so if it's a positively charged protein, it's going to get stuck. 
I'm just going to do them as plus. If it's a negatively charged protein, it's going to go right on through. If it's relatively neutral, it's going to be, it's not going to be detected easily. Now the problem is, we've got our positive charged proteins on there. How do we come off, <laughs> right? Because they, they like it. And it's not based off of the size where you can just keep on adding more solution and force it out. <clears throat> so the way that you get this off is you increase the ionic strength. So after you bind everything on there, you start to increase the ionic strength. So the buffers that you start to do, called the elution buffers, will slowly get higher and higher concentrations of salt. We use this a lot of times, you just, assuming that it didn't affect your protein. Um, so the chloride, or potassium chloride, because it's cheap, okay? You keep adding more and more and more and more. Then for a positive charge, if you're using sodium chloride, at some point in time, just like pH, there is an equilibrium between the charge of your protein and having too many sodium charges around it, okay? At some point in time, you get so much sodium on there that that sodium will force it off. The more positively charged your protein would be, the harder it is, the higher and higher the concentration you have to go of sodium chloride. So you actually separate it based off of its PI of the protein, the charge of the protein. Okay, by the way, if the column is negatively charged, and sometimes people get this, backwards. If it's negatively charged, it's called a cation exchange column. If it's positively charged, it's called an anion exchange. So it's kind of almost the exact opposite of what you'd think sometimes. Like this one right here is a cation exchange column, even though the column itself is negatively charged. <clears throat> So, the column is negative. Yeah. So what will like to bind it? Cations. So it's called okay. a cation exchange. So that's what you're swapping in and out. Okay. Okay. Or the column is positively charged and it's going to be an anion exchange. So it the nav is opposite here. I mean, the, 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 the resin will be positive and the proteins will be negatively bind too. <clears throat> so those are charged. Like, that's affinity. Does anyone know what's another type of affinity column? Ones that typically work even better, assuming that you're allowed to get away with it. If you can clone your own protein, those who work with me, ideally this is what we'd like to do. Um, it's another type, but these are specific affinities. Like, one example, like the one that gets used the most now, is called the his tag. <coughs> His tagged protein purification. It's just a special type of affinity column. So here, if you're able to do it, and you're able to clone your protein into a plasmid, an expression vector, you can get these that are called his tags, where on either the N terminus or the C terminus, they put a bunch of histidines in a row. Usually we find six to 12 histidines in a row. I'm just gonna use the one letter code for histidine, and the one letter code for histidine is H. That was one of the questions on the quiz. Okay, so, so we've got a bunch of H's in a row here on one end. Well, there's just some special property with histamines. I'm not an inorganic chemist, so I couldn't tell you why. But even though histamines tend to be positively charged, when you get a bunch of them together, they can form a special shape, and they love nickel. Okay, like nickel and cobalt. Okay, cobalt, they love cobalt even more, but cobalt's more expensive. And so what you do is you get these columns, and now they're relatively cheap, but on the very end is nickel. Or, or cobalt, three plus, like I said. That's called, a, the, the brain name for that used to be called a chalon, C-A-L-O-N. Um, that's supposed to be two plus. But it's nickel. And his, the histidine tag will bind really tightly to that nickel column or that cobalt column. And then once again, the way to get it off is you have to add really high concentrations, but this time not of salt. What would you add high concentrations? Since it's not, histines are not, it's not like a positive, an electrostatic plus and a minus charge is binding. It's a histidine that's binding. So what can you add to compete with that his tag? What makes sense? What would you be adding to try to knock it off? 
this is a special property of histidines. So you would add histidines. histidines. Except in particular, it's expensive kind of histidine, so we add imidazole. And that would be the functional behavior. That's just why the histidine looks like without the amino acid portion, just the R group. So you add imidazole, which is the R group of the histidine. And you, just have to, you start increasing concentration a bit, and it will essentially bump off this tab. That's not the only one. Another one that you can do is called a streptavidin or a biotin tag. <clears throat> and that one's even stronger because biotin and streptavidin are natural. Um, oh, what's it called? I just have a my brain for a moment. I can, I will say, uh, they, they bind, they're proteins that bind each other on the order of magnitude of an of a antibody binding to its antigen. So we're talking like 10 to the power of minus 15. I mean, it's hard. They almost covalent. Okay. And so usually the way to get that off, sometimes you have to actually cut it off. You can use the protease. But there, there are other ones, other types of tag. One's called a MIC tag. One's called a flag tag, where you actually have an epitope that binds. But you can imagine an epitope and the, the antigen, or the, the antibody, they bind so tightly that they recognize each other really well. So typically with those, you have to cut them off the column of the protease, which we'll talk more about that later. Those are affinity columns. And so this is just a little blurb that says all of that, that same thing that I've been saying. And that's what it's trying to show, which I think is really ugly, but <laughs> you can see it. Okay. Uh, ion exchange, we've already talked about that. That's the specific affinity ones that are cation and anion exchangers. And so there are pictures here. So for the rest of this chapter, or the PowerPoints I have on there, the only thing that we haven't covered that um, I may try to go over is just explain electrophoresis in detail. You may have done it, but just make sure you understand it. It does talk a little bit later on about um, Edmund degradation, but due to time constraints, I'm not going to quiz you or give you a test over Edmund degradation just because we don't have enough time. Okay.